everybody. This is Jackie here with the Sexy Politico. And today I am speaking with Lucy Rivers, Dr. Lucy Rivers. What would you call yourself? <laughs> just Lucy Rivers. <laughs> Not a doctor yet. Just uh just working just, working just on working it. on it. Just working on it. <laughs> just just trying to get the PhD. Just just working on it on the way. <laughs> well, we're talking today about gender representation in children's television. I was speaking to you earlier about how my my I have two I have two young boys and they love the show Bluey. And my parents could not believe that Bluey is a girl. And then I really blew their minds when I told them that Blue from Blue's Clues was also a girl. And I'm like, yep, my my boys are into blue girl dogs. (laughs) But I mean, and so we were wanting to discuss how um, different children's representation, how that affects kids, and also how these gender assumptions happen due to colors and things of that nature. But before we get started with that, uh, Lucy, could you introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so yeah, I'm I'm Lucy Rivers. I am currently um, a uh, a postgraduate researcher trying to get my PhD. My specific focus is within media and very particularly is, is within representation. I'll be honest and I'll say this isn't like my exact area of specialism, although, you know, anything to do with feminism, representation, all that kind of stuff, always my bag. My very, very particular area of concentration currently for my thesis is actually on sitcom and it's on a representation of uh, of gender, but also uh, most specifically of mental health um, and sort of looking at the representation of that however like I say you know I've done a lot on um on female representation within sitcom and also without so um generally speaking it's media and the importance of media and generally the importance of actually looking at and studying these kinds of things because yeah so basically it's it's just to try and put forward the idea that media is important and it matters, representation Absolutely. matters. You know, um, most of the ways that majority of the of people in the world will encounter or grow to understand elements of the world is going to be achieved through media consumption of some form or another. Therefore, you know, it forms the part, it forms the basis of people's underlying understandings of these things. This is so critical, you know. And, Abs- absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more on that. Yeah, which is great. I mean, especially it's having amazing. young children. So yeah. so in kids TV, what would what would you say the representation of of male identifying figures, I guess, yeah, to yeah. female identify? Honestly, I don't know how much kid TV you know, but you know it's the girls because they have eyelashes and the boys don't have <laughs> eyelashes. Yes, it is interesting the way that they choose certain um, physical attributes and just completely focus on those and um, emphasize those to the point where you can make these assumptions. And again, they're just pure assumptions because, I mean, gender is so constructed as a, as a thing anyway. But yeah, it's... Um, it's tricky and like I said to you you know I don't watch a huge amount of kids tv I think it's really interesting that you found this concerning and that you wanted to talk about it and everything because I do feel like this isn't talked about enough Mm -hmm. um purely because again these are so key these things are so key and I think there's kind of this assumption that oh, you know, it doesn't really matter. They're just little kids. You know, they'll just watch it as long as it's brightly colored or whatever. It's not, it doesn't really matter as if it doesn't actually form the basis of, of things that they will understand or ref- or that it doesn't reflect on the real world somehow. Whereas all of these things that are being shown will reflect in some form or another on the real world. It doesn't matter if they're a giraffe or like, or a dog you know, there's still being, there's still things like um, bonds of family or friendships or, you know, going to school or, oh, this is what happens when you have a party, all these kinds of things that are just so basic. And as an adult, well, you just, 
think of, we just barely think of it, but these could be the very first time kids encounter some of these um, organizations, institutions, ideas for the very first time. So it all matters. It, it, it matters. I, <laughs> it really does. I mean, we, I, you know, after having kids, you start having more parent friends and you start discussing different different shows and how certain shows are they feel they feel you you can tell where the love is in different shows mm. you can you take a show like bluey where each episode where the show's main focus is on experimental play but they but they show a family unit that doesn't always agree show split split people and that you know like there's divorce but they don't show it being easy but they show everybody working together for a specific mm. goal and I really like that about that show while there's other shows like Peppa Pig where that little girl is just rude she is <laughs> rude to her parents I'm like I, I don't let my kids watch Peppa Pig not because she's a girl but because she's just rude to her mother and I don't I don't want to teach my boys to be rude <laughs> That's interesting. I don't think I've ever heard someone say that they just think that Peppa Pig's rude. I've heard a lot of a lot of criticism about the pinkness generally, you know, just about like how explicitly gendered it is. Oh, I've heard a there's lot a of show criticism called Pinkalicious. There. I don't know if that oh. airs overseas, but we have Pinkalicious and that's just a wow. That's a bubblegum nightmare. Wow. A pink. <laughs> Pinkalicious, gosh, uh, her name uh, is Pinkalicious. Oh my gosh, uh -huh. that's um, that's that's quite a name to give a a character. Mm -hmm. And again, I feel like that really underlines this idea, this sort of this lack of thought. You know, just a, oh, let's just make something fun and bright for kids, and they just plant all of these, all of these things that basically are ingrained ideas that they hold themselves that they probably don't even realize until they're spitting something out that's so oh. basic, and you know, uh, they probably don't even realize. My you know, my how son came to me is. and said, "I'm not allowed to play in the kitchen because I'm a boy," and I'm like, "What in the?" world made you think that and he's like oh well, my that's... gosh and i'm like and then i'm like who cooks in this house and he's like daddy so why can't you play in the kitchen <laughs> daddy's a better yes. cook than mommy yeah we have different we have different jobs well you know what that makes me think of that makes me think of a really really alarming and sort of upsetting experiment that was done i really i cannot remember the um not remember the source unfortunately right now it was uncovering how gender bias was present in really young kids um because they were asking them about what their ambitions were for when they grew up there was a marked difference between what boys well what um what male children People we we believe are boys believe, believe are boys of course don't know they don't know yet probably you know so, well, uh, presenting boys, I guess, what presenting boys were coming up with at, compared to what presenting girls were coming up with. And more, more beyond that, was it was really interesting when they flipped it, when they said, if you were, and they gave them a different gender, what would your ambitions be? Um, and presenting girls came up with loads more options than before. Whereas presenting boys, like one of the presenting boys said, oh, if I was a girl, I'd have to be nothing despairingly as like they believed that they would not have the option to have a profession. So it just goes to show that these biases are being taken to heart unconsciously and very, very young and not even just about their own gender, but about other genders. And it's it's extremely pervasive and it's and it's yeah, it's really disturbing. My son came up to me and he said, when I grow up, I want to be a daddy, like daddy. I'm like, oh, that's nice. He's like, but can I also be an astronaut too? It's like, yeah, most astronauts were daddies. It's like, you can be both? Like, well, you're, oh. you're so daddy and a speech therapist. Oh. It's like, oh. oh. That's so cool. Like, unless you want to be a stay-at-home daddy, then that's a different thing, but. 
Mm. That's interesting. I mean, that could be that could be just them not realizing that um, sort of social jobs, I guess, you know, like family orientated roles aren't the same as jobs almost like. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I that's, stay that's home with my kids mostly mm. because daycare in this country is yeah. ridiculous. It's pretty ridiculous here too, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. It's <laughs> Where we lived before we moved, it was fourteen hundred a week, which was more oh. than I was making at wow. the last job I had before having kids. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not yeah. gonna. It's kind of like you have to have two jobs in order to be able to afford childcare. <laughs> like yeah. one job would completely pay for the childcare, which just makes it a wash. <laughs> yeah. The second so job then would actually be how you make money. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's no point. Yeah. But but uh, but yeah. So when when it comes to just like sort of like overall when thinking about representation in uh kids tv because this isn't you know super my area although i do do a lot of stuff about animation it just doesn't tend to be about kids animation as much yeah i mean um, when when you get to older kids animation hmm. there's there's a it seems to be very different in its hmm. representation and sexualization and things of that nature that i don't see in preschool tv Mm. but i mean still it i mean to be fair at this point the uh the hotness is animals walking <laughs> yeah. on on legs so they don't really need to wear clothes although no. there's an entire episode of bluey about them wearing purple underpants hmm. and i'm just like but they don't wear pants <laughs> <laughs> interesting interesting makes me think of the double duck thing you know. yeah <laughs> like they, there, there is an entire episode about magic underpants and i'm like like hmm. you don't wear pants huh well maybe the appeal was just the magicness of them then and just saying magic <laughs> pants though i mean they're australian so they're just going around saying magic pants and magic so pants. then my kids are like magic pants i want magic <laughs> pants but then they're pulling out their 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 two-legged trousers i'm like okay cool mm -hmm. you can have the the wear your magic <laughs> pants to school i'm good with that <laughs> interesting but yeah. uh but yeah anyway um i found this really interesting thing um so there's uh this really really interesting organization which i think looks absolutely great um uh called the gina davis institute on gender and media and uh this does really, really good work on representation in um, children's TV and stuff. Uh, one of their mottos, I think, is if she can see it, she can be it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so they, they had research in 2020 um, that looked at all of the representation of children's TV um, at, the, at the previous year, I think. And they found that just 45% of ch children's television episodes had a female lead. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this was, I mean, and that's not, that's not good, but apparently it had been a bit higher. It had been 52% in 2018 and it had actually gone downhill since then. So I think that's interesting because it proves that representation isn't just a hill to climb. There are going to be, um, you know, dips in this as well. Like it was improving and then suddenly for some reason it dipped down again. It's not a uh, it's not a straight it's not a straight road really, is it? Um but disturbingly enough, they do lots of lots of um they do lots of different angles with this an analysis and they found that female characters were three times more likely to be shown in revealing clothing or partially nude. I yeah especially and, when you get to yeah. older children apps yeah yeah but I think this even goes down to really quite young stuff so I'm not entirely sure what the full range of it is but like I said they um like I think I told you earlier they basically invented a tool that automatically analyzes um representation across these different things it, it sounds really revolutionary um and you know it's 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 really tricky I mean only two thirds of children's TV episodes pass the Bechdel Wallace test. I mean, that is a low bar. <laughs> it's a low <laughs> bar, really. You know, just two female characters. They have to talk to each other, and what they talk about cannot be related to another male character. 
that's that's it it's kind of shocking to think that only two thirds would pass the pass that test really i'm sitting there and i'm thinking about the shows my son watches and it's like mm -hmm. bluey passes mm -hmm. it's like blue's clues blue doesn't talk so you no. don't know what you don't know what blue and magenta are barking about no you have no idea yeah and again you know it's, it's just it's just a male male sort of lead really yeah he's, and he's the only one that's well no he's, he's not the only one that speaks but it he's the main person yeah. who speaks yeah the main one who, who speaks it's yeah so i guess i guess blue blue's clues wouldn't pass but yeah it's yeah. it's so it's so it's so di so difficult but you know there's there are problems across across there's... um across with male characters too for instance, they're more likely to be shown as violent and twice as likely to be depicted as a criminal compared to female characters. And male characters are more likely to be shown in professional positions, such as doctors or lawyers, with female characters much more likely to be shown in service positions. Yeah. If you extend that for STEM positions, well, male characters outnumber female characters two to one. It's really quite alarming some of the stuff and you know so so essentially what this goes to prove is that children are being trained to harbor unconscious biases from a very young age um i mean tweens consume up to six hours of media a day teens nine hours i don't have the stats for um preschool children on the amount they of that but i think that's because i think it's because it varies a lot more Based the, on household, our perhaps, pediatricians but... tell us to not mm. let our kids consume more than an hour a day but yeah that's mm. that's not it's not really i think parent, i think parents lie more when it comes to preschoolers because oh i think so you're you're yes, at you're more... told you're specifically mm. told no more than an hour with a screen and it's like yeah yeah no, no. yeah i think there is a lot of i think it would be very difficult to get accurate numbers on this because again yeah i think that there's a pressure and there's this feeling of you know, because there's explicit amounts that are said, you know, that it, we don't think it's great for development necessarily, don't do it more than this or whatever, or, you know, there's going to be lying. So it's going to be yeah. really hard to to get accurate numbers on that. Um, I think what's, I think what is alarming is the degree of sexualization that does exist in kids TV, though. I mean, Gina Davis Institute found that, um, found that there was a huge amount of it across the range of kids TV that they were analyzing. Um, in essence, that boils down to representation where a person's value is primarily or even entirely derived from their sexual appeal. Um, and so it's, you know, it's where physical be beauty is equated with sexiness or when sexuality is inappropriately imposed on, imposed on someone or when a person, person is being sexually object objectified. So there's a kind of like the, um broad strokes for what counts as sexualization in these cases the results really were concerning there was emphasis on physical appearance for female characters female characters were almost twice as likely to be better than average looking or stunning than male characters they wore more revealing clothing more likely to be shown partially nude again really really concerning i think it's also worrying as well that another study found that female characters in kids TV were more likely to use magic to solve their problems, hmm. like within the narratives, while male characters were much more likely to use STEM skills or physical strength. So this sets kind of really troubling ideas for gender. It sets really troubling ideas for what women can achieve in reality, as well as potentially limiting men's attributes sort of to the physical and these kinds of things as well I just think that it's really I mean it just sets up really disturbing tropes and expectations of real girls and women and I I I guess since my boys are so young it's mm -hmm. like I, I'm I don't notice a lot of these yet but then mm -hmm. I have seen some of these different things because my husband likes watching my husband likes watching cartoons that were based off of animes or I don't know what mm. the phraseology is. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah, I can, I can see exactly what you're talking about that you've that the magic and all of these different things. And I'm just sitting here going, 
yeah, Bluey's dad has a PhD. Mm. Bluey's mom works in uh, in airport security. Uh, yeah. He mm. has a PhD. He's an anthropologist. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you know, a male character is way more likely to have achieved a certain professional level. Mm -hmm. uh, like way more likely. And but his brothers are oil are oil drillers. So that's very physical. Yep. That's something very physical, but also technical and also STEM, more more STEM related. Which uh, again, I have no idea what an oil driller does. I know it's <laughs> I, I have I, my only oil. experience of oil drillers is from watching Armageddon in the 90s. <laughs> which I have a feeling has nothing to do with what oil drillers actually do. <laughs> Yeah, it might not be the most accurate representation. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Perhaps. feeling that they can't fly to space. <laughs> it's the uh, world. On, on average, no, they don't. I don't think. No. <laughs> so yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. But, no, but yeah, I yeah. think it. I think it's interesting. I think it sets up very different expectations. It sets up very different. Um, yeah, very different ideas. And and I think one of the things that we were going to talk about for sure was it was the colours, wasn't it? You know, just it the was, gendered it colours. Yeah. Because it is crazy. I mean, the gendered colours and gendered aesthetics, it's so outrageously prevalent that it can be easily identified by any and all parents, caregivers, educators. And yet change has just been so slow or in some areas just non-existent. I just think the use of colour to define toys and belongings you know based on gender it's so stark um that you know simply looking down two different aisles in a toy shop will tell you um which gendered aisle that it is because of the I basic I wonder colors that you will see if, i wonder if the creators of bluey purposely made bluey blue and a girl mm -hmm. just so that they could uh, you know You've got those parents who won't buy their kid anything that's a girl. Oh, but it's mm -hmm. blue, so it must be a boy, even because yeah. they're just not paying attention to the show. Because you watch the show for yes. five seconds and you know that they are sisters. Mm. Yeah. But they're like, oh, Bluey's a boy, Bingo's a girl. It's like, no, they're yeah. both girls. <laughs> yeah. I think it's very likely. I think I think that sounds like an example of very um considered and purposeful representation and i think it's great and i wish that there was a lot more of it you know because then you've got stuff on the other on the other side of things you've got peppa pig and you know yeah. and even dora the explorer you know she she wears pink doesn't she pink and purple dora the explorer yeah she yeah, yeah. i've watched one episode of that and then yeah. got really tired of my kid singing backpack <laughs> backpack over and over again and so i'm like i'm done with this show yeah let's go let's go watch some multicolored fish <laughs> yeah so yeah i think i think this and I, and I do think that it that there are better examples that i've noticed gradually i, I read an article that listed listed a few that had better representation in terms of you know the colors being used um and also the the sort of roles and you know uh leading female um characters for instance i think one was called Maisie. Yeah. Maisie yeah i've seen Maisie. Maisie yeah. is a like a doodle yes. is a doodle she doodles with with mm. i think if i'm remembering right she doodles with her cat maybe a mouse I don't. I definitely saw a mouse. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Oh yeah. 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 She doodles with her mouse, like mm. draws. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so I heard I some some good things there. I I heard about. I mean, um, Daniel Tiger. While yes, the lead character is a boy, they mm -hmm. they do have multiple female characters who, well, one of them does wear pink. They but she's also the sporty athletic one mm. so i mean I don't know. Mm. and of course they do have the girly girl but i mean it's unrealistic to not have anybody who is into pink and ballet and then mm. but then a different one who's like oh i like i like playing baseball with my brothers it's like mm. okay then yeah 
I think it's uh yeah, I, I think I think one of the problems that any kind of media will come up against is the burden of representation. So this is where even a slight move in the right direction will still get criticized a lot for not for seeming to not go far enough, you know. Um so I think essentially it's that kind of thing where you know if you get something uh will and grace was really famous for it because it was such a rare example of queer representation for instance on television and it got really torn torn apart by um by the queer community because they felt that it was stereotypical or that there were elements that they didn't agree with and they didn't like that representation but that was just a case of burden of representation because you can't be all things to and you know, at that community. time period, that time period, queer people were, were weird. I, you had friends on at the same time, the way that <laughs> yeah. friends dealt with trans people is mm. something I hope that people are, are talking about more. Oh, for sure. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of, I think because of it, uh, getting a new lease on Netflix, there's just this huge amount of, you know, let's go back and look at friends and, and stuff. And yeah, there's um, there's some really um, sexualized and a lot of homophobic stuff and a mm. lot of transphobic stuff in Friends. At the same time, uh, and at the same time, there was again, it does suffer a, a bit loving from gay, a loving gay yeah. couple with a child yeah. who were married and had a wedding, yeah. and I think it was like the second gay wedding on primetime TV. Yeah, it was the it was the first or the second. It might have been. I keep hearing that it was. The first I think it was the wedding, second gay sure. wedding, but the first lesbian wedding. That's. I think that's what I heard as well. So let's go. Let's go with that. But, sure. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So on the one hand, you know, it suffered from burden of representation for those kinds of ways. I, I believe a similar thing is going. We're going to see a similar thing when it comes to children's television when it starts to pull away a little bit from these really rigid overly gendered ideas I think you know you are start... starting to see more representation of neurodivergent kids such as oh, yeah? in Sesame Street and in uh, on it I, I find this one strange but the new Thomas Go Go Thomas has mm. a um I think he's autistic an mm. autistic train named Bruno and then Ooh, they're and they're starting to show more queer parents on Sesame Street. And I mean oh, they're not nice. main characters by any stretch of the imagination, yeah. but like they they'll have like a party at the end of whatever the thing mm. the Muppets were doing. And it's like, oh yeah, look, it's my mom's Susie and Tammy or whatever their names are. Mm. Mm. Huh. That's really interesting. I hadn't, I think I had heard about the Sesame Street because I'd heard about, um, cause it's, it's a Muppet that's yeah, like a puppet. Julie, at first she was, has... she was promoted by Autism Speaks and then Sesame mm, Street has, oh. knows <laughs> now that Autism Speaks does it's not speak for, does <laughs> not speak, speak for, for autistic, autistic people. Let's yeah. just say that nicely. And yeah. they, and they have moved away from that platform completely. Mm. Well, I've, yeah, I, I took some interest in in the representation of this um, new character on Sesame Street because I thought that they handled it pretty well from the clip yeah, that I, I watched. Do too. I thought it was, I thought it was good. It wasn't, it, you know, it, it, it properly demonstrated difference and in in a way that was still quite inclusive. Like it's like, yeah, no, there is there is definite difference in the way that this muppet will interact and that you interact you should interact with this muppet well, what i but loved it was still really also, quite inclusive and it was really quite nice what i loved is that as somebody with an autistic person in my family they said this is what autism looks like for julia mm. as opposed to saying this is what autistic people are like it's like no this is what yes. autism looks like for julia yes it doesn't because autism is different for everybody yes i really really appreciate that they went that extra mile because yeah that that's what proper good representation does it also highlights the fact that there is difference even within 
the the neuroatypical difference you know and that's I am autistic I'll just say that I'm autistic so I very much appreciate that especially because what they were dealing with was they were looking at representation of female autism essentially which varies so hugely from male-centric autism and uh, and again very so usually just within different female autistics it's just you know my big my big sister is autistic yeah. and it's very unusual it was unusual at the time for her to be diagnosed and she was diagnosed mm. at 10 which is yeah. very late to be diagnosed and it's because at that point they did i don't they didn't think girls could be autistic or it was just very mm. or it was so unusual that they were looking everywhere but there well, it's because they basically did all of the tests just on boys. So they kind of just excluded the possibility from their own research, essentially, in the early days, just by yeah. basically a neighbor, well. a neighbor of ours had a had a son who was on the autism. Well, I'm assuming he still is on the autism <laughs> spectrum yeah. and and said to my parents, have you had this test? And they were mm. like, we don't need that test. And then the next day, my mother's like let's get this test (laughs) yeah yeah Uh, I I think yeah it's really uh I think that's really interesting that they took those steps and that they've brought out that um that they are trying to represent those kinds of things however what I would say is the um Gina Davis Institute (laughs) did note that when it came to disability or and other abilities etc cetera, etc cetera. um characters with disabilities equaled only 0.8 percent i can name two i can only name two. yeah yeah and i, I think literally this, can name yeah, two yeah and that's despite you know 19 percent of yeah. people in the u.s having some form of disability I mean, probably of course, more yeah probably more than that and again it it might even be the, these results might even be skewed by visible disability versus invisible disability so we never know we can never right. be sure really everything we've been talking about has been has been great and i'm and i would love to talk to you more about this uh, at some point in the near future um what would you like to end make sure that everybody knows about before we end this podcast episode or anything that you would like to share? Um, I suppose, again, I would just like to reiterate that that media, that there is so much power in media and it really does deserve proper consideration and research and all these kinds of things there's this there's this idea that it's like a mickey mouse subject and and all this kind of thing it's it's just so inaccurate because it really does form the basis of all human understanding now in in many ways you know it is it is going to be the first um portal through which so many people grow to understand and go to understand and experience different aspects of the world and it will form the basis of of what their opinions and their beliefs are and so much of this will be unconscious and this is why this is why producers of content need to be mindful Mm -hmm. I think and especially when it comes to producing things for children and for developing children developing minds I think it's just so critical to um to put real thought and consideration to it i couldn't agree with you more thank you so much for being on this episode of the sexy political podcast um i will have links to all of lucy's social media down below and also some links that she sent me from the gina davis institute and things like that so if you would like to do your own research about this topic you can do so as well the and um So thank you very much for being on this episode and I will see all of you listeners next week. Thank you. Bye.